Good morning, church. Glad you are here and that you could be here to worship with us. Uh, it is a thrill to be able to worship God together, and we're glad everyone could be here. I know we've got some visitors with us. We're thankful that you could be here. And if it is your first time, uh, please let us know what we can do to make sure that you know that you are welcome and anything we can do to help out. We also want to get to know you, um, and so please allow us that opportunity as well. Uh, but if you're not comfortable with that yet and kind of want to sneak out at some point, we will not harass you, but we do want to make you friendly, feel like you're, uh, it's a friendly place. Uh, speaking of which, there's some things we want to do that we can help our neighbors. Uh, Facebook has changed some of its policies, and that's made it difficult, uh, a difficulty for some people to stream their services. You need a certain number of followers, and I said, I think we can help out. So Hallsville Church of Christ uh, needs some help with that. They may have crossed the barrier at this point. I'm not quite sure. But I said, we can probably help. So right now, a thing you can do to help uh, one of the congregations we've supported for some time is simply follow them on their Facebook page. Uh, if you go to Hawesville Church of Christ on Facebook, if you're comfortable doing this and want to do it, even now, uh, look for the one that uh, has the picture of the church building. It'll bring up two things. Click on that. I've already followed here. It'll show a button and you just hit follow and it should be good. The other one, uh, as an example, just so what it could look like, I've typed in Church of Christ at Indian Land and I uh, have not yet followed yet, even though that's where a dear friend of mine preaches. Sorry, Brian Deal. But that is one of the congregations we're going to be working with uh, and campaign this summer. So some of you that are going or that you may be interested in, Church of Christ at Indian Land may be one you want to follow and look at. Uh, the Church of Christ at Gold Hill Road is another one. Uh, but these are things that we can do to help other congregations to make sure they have access to streaming. Uh, that's a new policy. They've been doing it for some time, and then it switched. And like I noticed, they said, we can't stream. I said, I think we can help out a little bit. So if you're able to do that, please do. So we're continuing our series on Jesus First. What does that mean to have Jesus first in our lives? We've been going through several of the parables that Jesus has been teaching and unpacking those. There's a way we've been saying over the last few weeks that you can just isolate the parable and read it and you'll gain a certain degree of understanding, hopefully from it, a teaching from Jesus. But if we really sit with it and kind of use the tools we've been looking at to go a little deeper into it, uh, you'll benefit a great deal more. You'll understand why Jesus is teaching this particular parable where he's hoping you'll go because of the parable, what choices you'll have in the way that it will impact you. Today's parable is one where it really is about impact. And it is an interesting parable because it has a far history attached to it, a very near history with its particular audience. And in that very moment, there's an expectation that they will respond to it. In the moment that he's teaching, it's not just sort of a, a philosophical treatise that you would sit and ponder over time. He's expecting them, actually giving them the opportunity to respond in that very moment. And even though that was for his audience at that time, in that moment, the same opportunity exists for it to impact us today. And that's really what we want to be looking for at it. You ever had someone pray for you? This will help us lead into the parable. You ever had someone who loves you so much that they're praying for you? I bet right now there's people that are praying for you. I bet you might be praying for someone. And the truth is, you may not even know all the people that are praying for you. How they pray for you is another side of that, isn't it? You love it if someone prays. If they take the time to pray for you, they must love you. They must love you a considerable amount. But the way that they do that, the emotion they go to God on your behalf is a factor there, isn't it? For example, if they do that with a tremendous amount of joy, I'm so grateful for this person that I'm going to pray for them. I'm so grateful about the impact they've had on my life that I'm going to thank God that they're a part of that life. That is a way to approach prayer that is very, very powerful and, and should encourage us. And when we know that, it should move us. I have great respect for that. I know school teachers that they pray for students that they had 10, 20, 30 years ago. Those students don't even know. And the reason the teacher may pray for them, and the ones I'm thinking about, is because it was a very special student, and they may have had some element of their character that really stood out. And that teacher is going to God, praying that blessings would come on them throughout their whole life, and a really special moment. Um, those students, again, they don't even know that someone loves them that much. I bet you might be the recipient in that regard. 
There's people who pray for you don't even know. The flip side is, what if there's people that are praying and they're going to God, which is what you should be doing, but it's with tears, not of joy, but of incredible disappointment, frustration, hardship, and difficult relationships. I mean, they're strained. And they're going to God every single day, and it's not joy, it's, it's hope, it's love, because they're wanting the person's life to change for the better. But sometimes people's lives get caught up in places they didn't really intend to, they didn't want to, and maybe the pride around that builds up so they delude themselves and not recognize the hurt they cause on people. And people are praying out of disappointment. I've seen it happen over any number of addictions. I've seen it happen over any number of sins where people have turned on each other or betrayed one another and there's hurt and there's frustration. There's still prayer and there's still hope that things can turn around. But man, sometimes people are spent and there are prayers that are occurring out of disappointment, emotionally, spiritually, incredibly difficult situations. If you're thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm making those prayers now, just know that you're not alone in that. There's plenty of people, unfortunately, and we, we don't celebrate that, but you should recognize that you don't go through that alone. We do that together as a church. And if you're the recipient of that kind of prayer, Maybe you're saying, no, 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 not me. They're making too big a deal of it. There's the excuses. That's the pride. You may respond to that by recognizing that's a mirror. If someone loves you that much, they're holding up a mirror for you to reflect in that kind of care and how they can see that there's a better path for you. And there shouldn't be the hurt and there shouldn't be the beating down and there should be a, a greater level of concern for that love to reflect back on the people that are praying for you. Well, that's a lot of what's going into this parable. And it's a little bit more than an intellectual exercise. This parable is being given, Mark chapter 12, you can turn there now. It's given because Jesus loves someone so, so much. But it's a hard lesson they have to hear. And as humans, sometimes when we encounter hard lessons, we put the brakes on and we, we, we don't want to hear it. We don't want to engage with it because it's expecting us to make a change. Sometimes we think we don't have to make a change. But if it's God that's presenting that, Jesus who's speaking in truth in a parable that still has a teaching, still has an expectation, oh, we better listen. We really, truly had better listen. It's for our benefit and our blessing. And whatever we think, God's always going to have a greater degree of clarity, a greater degree of love, and always going to have a greater blessing ready for us in that. So it's with that that we hope our audience would listen. So let's think about this, where we're at in Mark chapter 12. I know usually we read it first, then we go and kind of sort the context. Let's establish the context first, then read into it. We'll take a little bit different approach. And over the last few weeks, what we have done, you've seen one technique is we would read the parable and then go a little bit before and a little bit after and kind of sort out where we're at. Mark chapter 12, we realize that Jesus is in Jerusalem. We know that because of Mark chapter 11. Let's establish who, what, when, where, and all that business. We're in Jerusalem. He's already made the triumphal entry in Mark chapter 11. So we know, if you've read the Gospels a handful of times or you're familiar with the story, you would already know that we are very much nearing the end of what Jesus came to do for the world. He's about to make that sacrifice for the world. It's a big moment. And in Mark chapter 11, he's made the triumphal entry into Jerusalem to fulfill that purpose. The fig tree, he's already caused it to wither. He's already cleansed the temple at this point with the money changers the second time. That's taken place. Things are being put in order and it's driving to that one moment. Even in the midst of that, you've got through the triumphal entry, there's people that are thrilled and cheering and, and then praising God with hosannas. And it's a very exciting moment, and it should be. That's the way it should be. But not everyone has that attitude about the moment. There are those that are pushing back, pushing hard against Jesus and recognizing Jesus is who he is and what he's come to do for a number of reasons. At the end of Mark chapter 11, we can see that his authority is challenged by uh, the chief priests, uh, the scribes, and the elders. 
And they're challenging him by what authority do you do these things? He's been preaching and teaching for over three years with this very clear message. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's been preaching very clearly, telling people he's going to die and he's going to be raised in three days. He's made those proclamations. We're nearing it. And even still, despite all the opportunity he's given in his teaching and his example and his miracles to prove he is the son of God. And he's come with perfect love to do a perfect sacrifice to utterly change everyone. There are still those who oppose him, rebellious, the chief priests, the scribes and the elders in this case. They challenge his authority. Now they can't, we don't have time to go into the full details of some of this, but read it when you have the chance. But you'll notice that one of the reasons they back off of him at this moment is they're fearful of the multitudes. So they have political ideologies and social principles and things that are preventing them for doing what they need to do. But Jesus is right there, which should be the whole reason that they act in the first place. But even though they've opposed him for many, many years, quite violently, with horrendous intent, even lying, and it'll get worse as it goes in the following days up to his crucifixion. He still loves them enough to give them this teaching. And in this teaching, there will be an opportunity for them to recognize where they actually are versus where they believe uh, with God and do something about it. All right, so let's jump into this. Oh, before we do that, just so we can clarify his emotional state in this. As he's going into Jerusalem, he's weeping. Can you imagine that? You're doing the thing you're supposed to do and you're weeping. As he drew near, this is Luke 19, this is actually verse 41, he saw the city and he wept over it. Why? He said, if you had known, even you, especially in this, your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Jerusalem and its people, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the elders, all of these people should have been joining in the rejoicing because the Messiah has come. The Savior has come. There was every reason to be excited. And yet, numerous people had rejected him. And they would call for his crucifixion. Instead of the peace that God himself was offering them, they generated chaos in a horrendous and tragic way against the very God they claimed to follow. Disappointment. But still, he gives them this moment. Our God is so loving and our God is so gracious. And he gives them this teaching. Let's go to Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 12 as we read this. He began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, and he set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat, and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now at vintage, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and they beat him and they sent him away empty handed. Quite a way to receive the master of the vineyard and his servants. Again, he sent them another servant. And at him, they threw stones. They wounded him in the head and they sent him away shamefully treated. And it continues. And again, he sent another and him they killed. And he sent many others and beating some and killing some. And then in this parable, we have this moment where the listeners go, what is happening here? Still having a son in verse six, his beloved, he also sent him to them at last saying, they will respect my son. Verse 7, but those vine dressers, they said amongst themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and they killed him and they cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? What will the owner of the vineyard do? Jesus answers that. He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This one seems pretty clear, doesn't it? If you're even a marginal history of the Old Testament, this parable is allegorical. It has symbols that allude to very specific teachings to where it is easy for them to draw the meaning out. Obviously, God is the owner, 
And he's exp- the fruit would come out of the plans that he had. And he's sending servants. And they are being killed and mistreated. It's not hard to see that this is a reference to the prophets. And how brutally prophets were treated. The interesting thing about this is he's telling this to people who would definitely know this. If you are a chief priest, a scribe, and an elder, you should have some rather strong expertise in the scriptures, in the law. There is a passage in Isaiah chapter 5. It isn't some esoteric hidden passage. In Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, where there are strong allusions and connections, parallels between this parable in Mark 12 and what's being said in Isaiah chapter 5. Israel is being compared to a vineyard. There is a wall built around. There is a tower. But in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, this is God's judgment against Jerusalem and Judah for their failures. Now, if that sets in your knowledge and you are hearing Jesus unfold a parable in which he is drawing a connection between those exact same bits of imagery and that previous one was about judgment, you kind of get a sense of where this is coming towards you as you sit there and hear it. He's using scripture to construct a mirror. He's using their far history of their ancestors and people to construct and build parts of that mirror. He's using parts of their very, very near history, their interactions with him as the son, to construct that mirror. And he's doing this as God, which means the holiness, the love, the justice, the care, the purposes of God is being put in to construct that mirror. And he's giving them this parable to clarify the position to reflect to them who they actually are in relation to God versus how they want to view themselves. They've corrupted their position because of their adherence to political ideologies and social principles, caring about the multitudes, caring about Rome, caring about elevating themselves up because of their wealth, their status, their position. They address the part as religious leaders. They have the titles of the religious leaders, but they do not have the heart and the mind nor the actions of religious leaders, not true ones, not real people after God. Otherwise, they would have been pointing towards Jesus, elevating Jesus. They would have stepped aside humbly and allowed Jesus to take all the prominence that he deserves and needed to establish what he was going to be doing. And yet they reject him. And in Jesus telling them that he's the chief cornerstone meaning he is the integral part, the fundamental part of the building that God is creating in his plan of salvation for all of mankind to redeem us, to establish his kingdom, and they reject that cornerstone? He's now confronting them with the immediate moment. This is a teaching that reaches back into scripture, back into history, in the far history, the near history, and in the moment. It is a very powerful parable that he's unfolding here. And the point of it is, he's giving them an opportunity to respond. It should impact them. It should impact them. And if they are really the people of God, and they look into that mirror framed by God to see how they are in comparison to what they should be, what he would expect them to be, and if it's any difference whatsoever, the humble heart would change. The humble heart would turn. The humble heart would be disappointed with themselves and repent. And do whatever it took to please God. That's what they would do. The scripture then gives us, well, sort of how they respond in that moment. And it's not good. It's not what we would hope for. Not at all. Verse 12. Because of what he said to them in Jerusalem and the triumphal entry on the way to the cross, giving this teaching out of love, They didn't like what they saw in that mirror that he constructed out of scripture and history in the moment. Truth. He gave them truth. They sought to lay hands on him. They wanted nothing to do with what he said. And instead they rebelled once again and chose to oppose once again and try to stop him once again. How long suffering is God with such rebellion? But he gave them that moment. They knew he had spoken the parable against them. They knew. 
kind of interesting. Some parables, even the disciples are like, what in the world does this mean, Jesus? Not this time. They knew exactly what he was talking about. They knew this was about them. And they didn't like that it was about them. They elevated themselves. Can you imagine? You hear the words of God, and you're like, I don't like it. I'll cast it aside. I don't like it. I'll tear it up. I don't like it. I will oppose God to his face in the midst of it, all the while claiming to be the most righteous people in all of Jerusalem and all of the world. And yet, even today, we face that same temptation. When we look into the mirror of the scriptures, and sometimes we don't like how we look compared to the scriptures. Their reaction was the saddest thing in this moment of tremendous love and care for Jesus. Disappointed, crying, tearing, going to them. This is God going to them and giving them this message to impact them and turn them around. They knew he'd spoken against them. They sought to lay hands, but this last sentence, it's it's horrifying. So they left him and went away. They left him. Jesus didn't leave them, but they left him. Jesus didn't leave them because he still went to the cross and he died for their sins too. Jesus didn't leave them because he still went to the cross. And if you remember, it's that stunning passage. He's hanging on the cross and as the chief priests, scribes, elders, and all the people who betrayed him and lied about him and called for his death, he still says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. What a loving God we have. What a patient God we have. I'll tell you right now, that temptation to go, I created the universe in you. I can uncreate you right now. It would be tough. But our God is perfect love. What will he do? We know what God's going to do on the day of judgment. It's very clear. The Bible makes it very clear. The day of judgment is coming. Matthew chapter 25, the parable at the end of us, tells there will be a separation. He uses the uh, example, the metaphor of the sheep and the goat, and the people that are faithful go into heaven, everlasting life. Those that are, reject him, eternal destruction. That's pretty clear. We will be judged by the words of Jesus, John chapter 12, verse 48. That's very clear. We know exactly what we, the standard we live to, and more than the standard we live to, the path that lays out for righteousness and holiness and goodness and pleasing God. We know that. We have it in the words of God. But that will be what we'll be judged against, John 12, verse 48. We know that Jesus will be doing the judging, Acts chapter 17 and verse 31. As Paul was speaking to the Athenians at Mars Hill, he's appointed a day, God is appointed a day, which will all be judged by Jesus, the one he raised from the dead. We know what he will do. He will keep his promises. And for the faithful, the humble, those that honor God, those that look into the mirror and they shift and make themselves to be exactly the image that God wants them to be. And we know that's a process that you work on over time. And God is so gracious to to give us that time. But these people are rejecting that process. They're not even trying, not even a little bit. God asks for a whole heart and a whole mind. They give him nothing because they're caught up in the ways of the world. So they're less than what they should be. We know what God will do. We know, as we said, what Jesus will do. Even after this teaching, he will still go to the cross. He will still die and shed his blood. He will rise again. And he will ascend into heaven. And he will, it hasn't happened yet, he will come again. He will come again. We know that's going to happen. God said so. The other side of this, what will he do, is I think about the individuals between the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. We group those together, but it's really individuals that make that up. And as Jesus gave this teaching, I wonder about those individuals in particular to begin with. What will they do as individuals? As a group, we know that they really, really set themselves against Jesus and would carry that through. The chief priests definitely into the book of Acts. We would see the horrendous things that they would do. But not all the individuals did that. We know Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and yet he didn't reject Jesus in the way that many of the Pharisees did. We know that Josephus, he was on the council, and he didn't. So we understand that this is an individual choice that unfolds here. 
What will he do? The individuals in that story. Many of them we do not know. But then we come to that moment where we look at this parable and we have to look at the other side of it. It was for those men at that particular time. But the Holy Spirit put this in the gospel for us to read today. And in doing so, the parable becomes relevant for us. And we have to begin looking at ourselves in Scripture, in our far history, in our near history. And in this moment, even now, a mirror built out of the love, the holiness, the care, the identity of God and what he expects for us. And we have to confront the question, what will we do with this parable? A warning, an encouragement that it is. Will we reject it? Maybe not in the grandiose way that they did, but are we rejecting it even in little bits? Little bits. Are there parts of us that we hold back from God? Are there parts of us that we know He doesn't want us to be like that and He's disappointed in, and yet we find ourselves adhering to them? Think back to the way that the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders held themselves up because of their political affiliations, their ideologies, and their social values and principles, where they allowed the whims of those things, not godliness, but those worldly things, to sway them away from God. Do we do that sometimes? Do we allow those things to sway us away from God? To separate us from one another? Look, I'm going to be really honest. I don't care what political party you're in. I really don't, as long as you're godly first. The next passage, they try to trap Jesus again in Mark chapter 12 with a coin about paying taxes. And he gives that beautiful thing, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. That's the one we remember the most, quote the most. But the second part of that, but God, the things that are God's. And for the Christian, that should be the part of that verse that shines the brightest. Because we recognize we are God's. Not just that we are God's people, but we are God's. So the entirety of who we are, our thinking, our affiliations, our social principles, our beliefs, are God's first. First. Everything else falls under that. Sometimes the whims of the world, in whatever way, social uh, ideologies and beliefs and values and whatever, they sway at us and they hit us from so many different directions. And they pull at us to think a different way about what God says about things in the world. We elevate men to a certain degree and we're like, yes, I'm following after that guy. And if you don't agree with it, then I'm totally opposed to you. No, not in the church. We're God's first. God's first. And we see things on TV and in movies and they pull us, well, you've got to think this particular way about people. And you've got to change your ideas about morality and ethics and marriage and gender and, 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 and whether certain moral things are not moral anymore and we shift it based on social whims. No, not if we're God's people. It's God first. Whatever God says is first because render to God the things that are God's. And we are God's. This is God's church. There can be no compromise. Yeah, 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 but I know, but all my friends, my friends think this way and the Bible says another way. I care about my friends. I get that. I really do. But you may be in the position to help your friends see God more clearly. We give to God what is God's. And you say, yeah, but I know, but there's so much social pressure that comes at me at work and so much at school. Do you not understand? Yes, I absolutely do understand. I really, truly do. And so did all the people throughout the history of Christianity that are in the same position, some to a much grander degree. And it cost them their lives. It cost them their families. It cost them comforts. And yet they stood firm. They did not bow their knee to the world. They bowed their knee to God first. And when we hear this parable, this invitation of God, and we see this mirror that he's created, we have to look and say, is the entirety of my life, does that reflect God back in that mirror? And if not, am I willing to change? Or am I willing to fight against God in that moment? May we never fight against God in that moment. 
but be people who humbly say, God, I am sorry, and I will repent, and I will turn. Let us as his people, and let us as his church, and us take ownership to be exactly who God wanted us to be. And if that temptation and an outside force comes in and tries to shift that, close them down. Not worth listening to. And you can do that out of love and care. Not cruelty or meanness, because that's not what God's people does. Look at the encouragement we had in the scriptures. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus about where their allegiance goes. We bow our knees to God and God alone. God above all. From whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That's who you are. Not just in name, but in being. He gets to that. That he, God, would grant to you according to the riches of his glory, of which there's nothing greater. There is nothing greater. Anything else is less. And you were created for the greater, not the less. That you would be strengthened and with might through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ, may be dwell, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love. That's not a passing care for love, but that you are rooted and grounded in God's love. Everything that you do, your actions, your thoughts, your care, your behavior, your devotion to God, the way you interact, even with the unrighteous, even with the disappointments, even with the joys, is founded in that godly love. That changes everything. It really does. Stop and think about the depths of God's love, and that's what he's going to get at here, the fullness of it. That we may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's the path that God gives to you. What will you do? What will you make of that? Every day you are beat down with a choice to choose the world or to choose God. And maybe that's in a very, very small way. Maybe we take hold of some grudge, we hold that deep in our heart from 30, 40 years ago. Maybe it's some degree of hatred. Maybe it's a, an, an attitude that we hold on to that we're ready to criticize anybody and everybody at the drop of a hat because they're not exactly like us. Maybe you make an excuse because it's just one cuss word. I just say it when I'm really mad. It doesn't really care. Small things that we, we dismiss. We ought to give greater care to those things. Out of love for God. The fullness of it. We ought to give greater care for one another. Because we're rooted and grounded in God's love. The fullness of it. We're not partial Christians. We're holy Christians. God's people. God's people. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory. It's all about God. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. I love that he said to all generations. In our culture today, there's this wild thing happening where the generations have to attack each other. I think it's the craziest thing in the world. They do it all the time. I saw a video the other day about Gen Z attacking Gen Alpha, attacking Gen X against the boomers, which has a derogatory term. I mean, I'm ready for us all to stand up and fight each other in here. Get it out of the way. Move on. Just move on from it. And the church, we're doing things for all generations. The older generation's looking out for the younger. The younger looking out for the older. Those of us in between looking out for everybody, everybody looks out for everybody. Unity, unity. You might get aggravated by someone's terminology and words and choices and their, their favorite music versus yours. What, who cares? You like what you like, be happy with it. If the other people don't like it, that's fine, whatever. But I like that all the generations of the church come together rooted and grounded in love to the glory of God. Render to God what is God's. It's all God's. We are God's. We are God's people, and we will hold nothing back from him. That's the parable he gives, and it's tough because he expected it to impact them. At least he gave them the opportunity at that moment. It's the same for you today. When you read a parable like that, it should have an impact on you in this moment. 
in which you are ready to throw yourself in front of that mirror. It could be scary. It could be scary. But you don't forget Jesus was there with them in that moment. And it was the loving Jesus who would guide them through the scary parts. It was Jesus who would handle the parts they couldn't. He died for their sins. We can't do that. And Jesus is not distant from you right now. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants you to be with him. He will support you as well. What will you do? Not what will they do or some other person. What will you do in your relationship with God? Today we're all closing with the invitation. It's a good moment to consider what you will do. Where are you in your relationship with God? Are you holding anything back? Please don't. When you recognize that, give it all to him. Your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole life, your whole purpose, your whole intent. Jesus first. If anything holds you back and inhibits that, and you're aware of it, you've got to find a way to lower its priority significantly and elevate God's. It may be a conversation with a family member or a friend. It may be a conversation to say, I'm, I'm sorry for the way I've been acting. But deal with that. In this moment, what will you do? You may not yet be a Christian, but you can be. Jesus loves you and he wants to cleanse you of your sins. If you are ready to obey the gospel because of your faith, because you believe, if you're ready to repent, if you're ready to commit to God, if you're ready to acknowledge him as Lord of lords, King of kings, the Son of God, who God sent, if you're willing to be baptized for the remission of your sins, that's the moment your sins are cleansed away to become a new Christian. Do something about it. If there's a way that we can help you and lift you up, let us know as we stand and as we sing.